Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Bob Kamemoto. I'm from American Savings. And on behalf of the Hawaii chapter, I would like to welcome you to this morning's presentation by Paul Brubaker of TZ Economics on the current state of the local economy. As many of you already know, Paul is the principal of TZ Economics, a Hawaii economics consultancy. His background and research on the Hawaii economy and financial risk analytics stems from a 25-year affiliation with the Bank of Hawaii, concluding as its chief economist. He's a graduate of Stanford University, did graduate work at the University of Wisconsin, and received his PhD in economics from the University of Hawaii. He has lectured extensively in international monetary and financial economics, and is a member of the American Economic Association, the American Finance Association, the National Association for Business Economics, from which he holds a certified business economist designation. Paul is no stranger to the RMA Hawaii chapter, having done several economic presentations for us in the past, and the chapter was fortunate to have Paul provide a presentation in November of last year in the midst of the COVID-related shutdown of the Hawaii economy. Here we are now eight months later in the midst of the reopening of the local economy, and we are both anxious and curious to hear what conclusions, comments, and predictions Paul may have to offer on the current and future state of the local economy. Uh, Please hold your questions or, or enter them in the chat function. And if there's some time after the presentation, Paul will try to address them uh, at the end. Um, so the Hawaii chapter is pleased and fortunate to again have its have as its presenter again this morning, economist Paul Brubaker. So take it away, Paul. Mahalo, Bob. Uh, thank you, Grant, for uh, setting this up. And uh, Bob's right, um, I, I tend to go long. I tend to have too much material. I tend to spend too much time on it. So if you'd enter your questions into the chat, um, I will try to summarize and uh, provide a, a written response that I'll share through Grant at, um, uh, I think it's Hawaii National. And um, um, if we do have time at the end, uh, um, feel free to, uh, unmute and jump in once we get to that point. I've I've muted most of the video feeds just to keep the bandwidth down. Um, so I'm going to jump right into my slides and I'll make sure to get a, a PDF copy of those uh, to uh, Grant and the organizers so that you can uh, check it out uh, if you're interested in following up. Most of the slides have uh, sources, references at the bottom of each uh, screen and those the links are usually live if you want to go find the data and um and i do have some other material if uh, things come up that are outside the scope of this presentation uh that are kind of related but didn't sort of you know didn't quite make the cut um and uh the the um focus today is going to be on the recovery but it's more of a macro perspective and um and then we'll try to fill in with the hawaii data uh where we can to um to see what the you know the local version of of these bigger issues uh um uh, look like as the recovery unfolds um bob reminds me we did get together in november uh in which month i believe south dakota was the most toxic place anywhere on the planet in terms of per capita COVID morbidity. And I think, I haven't checked in a while, so I haven't looked up the data for Brazil or India lately, but I'm pretty sure South Dakota may still have the record uh, for anywhere, except for the Vatican City on two days in, in um, October of last year where they did a big test and found a bunch of cases. Um, so we've come a long way from that moment just after the reopening of tourism, you remember under the safe travels program with uh, pre-flight testing protocols in place, come a long way, a peak of national morbidity and mortality uh, in June, uh, combined with an attempt to <laughs> do something at the, at the uh, state uh, US Capitol. I don't know what the hell was that all about? And um, here we are now with a rip roaring recovery and a lot of recent concern about inflation, which kind of is the backdrop to where we start with just an example of what's out there. 
uh, and uh, which um, allusions to which uh, you'll find in the financial media every day now. So here are median uh, U.S. home prices um, over, you know, a half century. So I'm pretty sure we can infer a long run uh, from this data set. I've adjusted for consumer price index uh, measured inflation. And you can see the cycles in valuations uh, within a 99% uh, confidence interval, a two standard error bandwidth around that regression I've estimated with a one and a quarter percent a real appreciation rate for homes. And, and, and the cycles are the ones we're familiar with, uh, Camelot in the 1960s, uh, the inflation hedging event in the uh, 1970s where we all gravitated to commodities uh, and real assets uh, uh, to protect against uh, inflation. Uh, the Japan bubble in the 80s, uh, at least as we know it here in Hawaii and the subprime bubble in the early 2000s. Uh, the convert, uh, convergence to trend in the 20 teens is notable because we put a lot of architecture, as you know, as financial services professionals into the mortgage lending uh, origination and distribution uh, and portfolio management uh, system servicing to um, mitigate morally hazardous behavior and and adverse selection. So I think we have a, a better system now than we did going into the new century. Um, uh, much better capitalized for sure. Uh, and there you have the COVID event right at the end and this little jump in home prices. That's that's the bubble people are talking about, by the way, that, that the little zig there. And uh, so to summarize most of what I'm gonna talk about today, I think it's a transitory. I mean, that doesn't look like a bubble to me yet. I mean, it's too early to tell. I call it a tiny bubble, like Kui Lee's song. Um, it might already be over. And we'll look at some local data that uh, just has a hint of that. Um, but there's definitely a robustness about the economic recovery year to date, at any rate, since the new year, um, that um, is um, not inconsistent with concern about um, renascent inflation, uh, given the strength of the um, of the recovery. So let's dig into those data. Uh, here's the term structure of inflation expectations implied by the difference between nominal treasury yields and TIPS uh, yields, uh, yields on uh, treasury inflation protected security. So you take the nominal yield, subtract the yield, real yield, and you have an implied inflation forecast at several maturities, five through 30 in maturities. The key here is twofold. Well, three, one is that the inflation expectations as revealed in these bond prices, right, have, or yields, have uh, moved back to the range they were in over most of the early part of the last decade. And um, have, they've uh, inverted. Uh, so the five-year expectation is a half percentage point or a full percentage point higher than the 30-year expectation. expectation. That suggests, again, a transitory um, phenomenon at work more inflation in the short run than the long run. And then of course they've, they've begun to, they've zigzagged downward. That is to say they maybe have overshot already relative to the 2% objective or goal of the Federal Reserve based on the personal consumption expenditure deflator. When you turn to the consumer price index, which tends to run about a half percentage point higher than the PCE deflator measure of inflation, the Fed's um, target, the um, experience, as you recall, for most of the decade has been one in which inflation has not met the implied uh, target um, in terms of the CPI, which is now a Hawaii-wide measure, and they've changed the frequency of the measure. Uh, but it's been pushing up, and in the most recent monthly data in the U.S., and by the way, there's a new data point. I think I have May in here, and I think that, oh, maybe... Maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that. June's not out yet, next week. But, um, you know, 5%, a surge in CPI measured inflation to 5%, and 3.75% for the urban Hawaii index, which are the dots. And you can see they've changed the frequency of, of the reporting. And so moving with the U.S. into this higher inflation zone, although if you go back several years and track where the CPI would have been had inflation 
actually ran, run at uh, 2%, um, you know, we're, we're still below that. So like if you started counting in 2016 and, and the CPI adhered to 2% as, as opposed to 2.5%, um, we, you know, we still would have gotten back to that 2% trajectory. So yeah, maybe this is transitory. Um, I'm, I'm guessing it doesn't have legs on it. Most of the concern is coming from um, factors that are more microeconomic in origin than macroeconomic in origin. Although clearly I was going to put this slide, but the, the one nerd step beyond, but um, you know, if you, if you do aggregate supply, aggregate demand and in inflation output growth space as the Y and, and the X axis, right? So inflation on the vertical axis and growth of uh, output on the horizontal uh, axis. And then the potential GDP growth rate, say 1.8% would be sort of a full employment benchmark or trajectory um, uh, the, at which uh, aggregate supply and aggregate demand in equilibrium uh, would cross over at the um, inflation rate consistent with the monetary policy goal, right? That at that intersection, what's happening is aggregate demand is being is rebounding because of um, a restoration of consumer confidence, uh, stimulus from the federal government, uh, aggressively accommodated monetary uh, policy posture. So aggregate demand is shifting out, but aggregate supply is also shifting to the left, so to speak, because these commodity prices are rising as a consequence of supply chain disruptions and the temporary shutdown of productive capacity during the course of the pandemic, so in some cases, straight up lockdowns. And, um, and you know, the difficulty ramping up production uh, once you get going again, and a lot of talk about people having trouble finding workers who are kind of, you know, their job sucked before COVID and <laughs> you're not going back, not under the same terms, that kind of thing. Um, it's instructive, these are PPI indices for iron, steel, and lumber. If you look at the commodities prices, uh, these are um, Chicago Mercantile Exchange uh, lumber futures contracts. So um, in, in dollars per thousand uh, board feet, lumber prices have fallen by half in the last seven or eight weeks. So again, I think, you know, once the, the, once uh, we, we get back to uh, fuller employment, once the supply chains uh, aren't all jammed up, uh, once the factories are, are back in operation, uh, most of these things should settle down. But in the meantime, right, it's more expensive to build a house. And right at the time when everybody seems to want a house uh, in order to pimp out an office. So these collisions are happening in the micro side of the economy. But in terms of the macro side, uh, I, I think there's less of a case to be made uh, of um, systemic inflation of the sort that, you know, Friedman taught us about that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And uh, I'm not going to read the bullet points in general here, but uh, you get the drift and I'll move into look at some of the numbers and the data. So if you ask economists what their forecasts are right now, uh, and these were surveys done a couple months ago um, when the consensus was, for example, that the CPI would rise at a 2.8% and the PCE deflator at a 2.6% in a survey of business economists uh, back in the spring. You know, my guess is these might be a percentage point higher uh, at the max. And we get some guidance from the Fed, which in March projected 2.4% PCE deflator rates of inflation for the current year. And, uh, and then in their June meeting, um, upgraded their quarterly forecast to 3.4%, a full percentage point higher. But they too, as you probably know, have been indicating their belief that the, the factors at work are transitory. Uh, and more, more supply side oriented than demand side oriented. In terms of the Fed's policy posture, more generally, um, <clears throat> obviously the balance sheet is, um, you know, at 8 billion and, on, in terms of assets and liabilities is um, bigger than it's ever been. Remember the world before Lehman Brothers when none of this was even going on, um, except for $100 of $100 bills that drug dealers were using uh, for international payments. Um, the about four trillion, about half of the tri uh, of the eight trillion uh, that's out there uh, on the Fed's balance sheet on the liability side is just reserve deposits, right? It's just this deep pool of liquidity that's there to backstop uh, the banking system. And then I think people have been 
following more closely lately uh, is the shift out of the treasury's account as it deploys uh, the, the third wave of fiscal stimulus in a year. And um, so you see the growth of re reverse repos, which are uh, the counterparties there are mostly, um, you know, money market mutual funds, I think. Um, so it's sort of moving from the treasury part of their book to, to this special area that they created so that non-bank entities could, could have access to uh, this liquidity. Um, and, and as we know from the minutes of the Fed meeting, the FOMC meeting last month, uh, they're beginning to begin the conversation uh, about tapering, um, but we're probably a year away. Um, you know, maybe a maybe a target rate, overnight rate increase uh, within the next year, uh, but um, almost certainly a, a a lot of forward guidance before we get to actual uh, leveling off of asset purchases and and tapering off uh, thereafter. It may come quicker than it did in the twenty teens. But I think what's happened with interest rates the last six months is very similar to what happened with the taper tantrum um, back in 2013, where uh, you know a few stray remarks by uh, Fed Chair Ben Bernanke at the time, you know about well we could sell securities in, in addition to buying them, which you know and bond market participants' heads exploded, and so they ran away from uh, Treasuries. Um, we're seeing, you know, a little bit of that uh, right now. I think a little bit of an oh, it's a little bit overdone. And in fact, I haven't updated this data set for a couple of weeks. So the the rates have actually the term structure is actually backed off. Last I heard, the ten years, you know, gone from 160, 170 back to 130, 140, something like that. But the Fed has made clear and has reaffirmed in each of its recent meetings the trajectory uh, over the next several years of, uh, uh, you know, maybe a 25 basis point. Uh, increase and maybe 50 basis points uh, thereafter uh, pushing out through 2023 uh, before really getting into normalization uh, closer to uh, mid-decade. And um, uh, my, my guess is that's probably the right you know track given the speed with which economic recovery is unfolding. Just a final point about inflation concerns. I mean, talk is cheap, uh, but if there's so much concern about inflation, then why aren't we seeing these premia, inflation premia, uh, showing up, for example, in mortgage rates. Um, no, not to mention uh, uh, treasury notes. And as I say, I've, I've got 1.6 there as the benchmark uh, at, at the time I did this uh, graphic. But, uh, you know, it's like, I don't know, we could look it up. It's probably 134 today or something like that. Um, finally, uh, the, with respect to the concern about um, the size of the Fed's balance sheet, the, the rate at which it's grown, uh, having uh, uh, macro, you know, inflation based inflation impact. Um, you have to remember the, the money stock went up because people, there was an increase in the demand, precautionary demand for liquidity, right? Confidence during the COVID event um, was eroded. Uh, people flee to the safety of cash and their single family detached dwelling. And um, that increase in the demand for liquidity, for in, in the demand for money was accommodated by an increase in the M2 money stock. Uh, and the flip side of which, which is why you don't see an impact on inflation, is that M2 velocity dropped. Uh, so right, MV equals PY, right? Or in uh, the time derivative of natural logs, the growth of the money stock, uh, plus uh, the change in velocity, which ordinarily is nil, uh, equals uh, inflation plus the growth of real output. and if the growth of real output is 1.8% and then the inflation goal is 2%, then two plus 1.8 is 3.8% on the right-hand side of the equation should match you know, money growth if velocity is constant. Well, velocity was not constant uh, last month because everybody was hoarding. And, uh, and indeed, if you look at velocity over time, it's kind of fascinating that it has been going down for, that's a story for another, I mean, a conversation for another time because you remember in the financial innovation of the 80s and 90s, uh, velocity was going up. Anyway, no impact on inflation from these monetary uh, policy moves. And um, so that allows us to switch gears and look at the real side of the economy a little bit, excuse me. <coughs> um, and here's what's happening uh, with tourism, which all the haters are out <laughs> because the tourists are back. Like they don't want the jobs or income. Um, so here's what's happening with domestic passenger counts. 
uh, which for a summer season uh, may be an all-time high right now. This is the data through Tuesday, I think. Um, what's today, Thursday? Uh, maybe Monday, fourth, the 4th of July weekend anyway. And uh, at 30,000, that would be just you know over the top for the, this week. These are weekly uh, data. And you can see the gradual um, recovery since the reopening the, under the Safe Travels program on October 15th. Not so much on the international side where there's basically a couple airplanes uh, you know, full of very important people um, coming from overseas, I mean, coming from international origins uh, to Honolulu. So uh, not a meaningful number. And where would they stay? Um, when you look at the composition of the recession, um, it really tells you how this recession differed from the investment-led recessions of the past and why the nature of the recovery now uh, is uh, um, evolving uh, the way it is. So it was a consumption-led recession, right? It was, it was we, the people, choosing not to go out and eat, uh, not to go on a trip to Hawaii, right? It affected the services side of the economy, not so much the good side, and to the extent it did, only temporarily. And then, of course, we all got on Amazon and started buying stuff like crazy. Uh, an example on the right side of this screen uh, where, it, uh, where that dichotomy is uh, quite vivid, Right, we continue to eat, of course, uh, just not from food services providers. And that recovery in the food services sector is sluggish enough that it suggests that there may be, in addition to what we see here, an, an hysteresis, right? A, a, a temporary change that turns out to be permanent. So possibly a permanent impairment of food services as an industry uh, relative to the pre-COVID uh, you know, uh, behavioral uh, norms, and we'll just have to see how that works out. Um, GDP in levels uh, was on a modest growth path for the U.S. during the 20 teens. Uh, Hawaii began to detach uh, from the, I've aligned the scales here, so Hawaii was on the same trajectory until the mid 20 teens, and so we kicked out Governor Abercrombie, which didn't do anything, and um, here we are, and then GDP in Hawaii stopped growing for a year and a half before, like before COVID, Hawaii's economy was not even growing, but nobody's even talking about it because there's a record number of tourists or something, which there was not. There's not record numbers of tourism exports at any rate, and not even record numbers of persons. But maybe I'm getting that one wrong. Anyway, the economy had already stagnated in Hawaii pre-COVID, and then we got the beat down from COVID which, because of the structure of the economy, was more severe for Hawaii. Now, when you look at the national economy, it, it was pretty severe nationwide. So the 30% decrease at an, annual, at an annual rate in U.S. GDP has got to be on the record book somewhere. And, of course, in the third quarter of last year, the uh, um, equiproportionate 30% uh, increase in GDP has got to be another record. But remember, when you go from 100 to 70, which is a 30% decrease, going up by 21, which is a 30% increase, doesn't actually get back, get you back to 100, gets you back to 90. So we're still, as a nation, as a national economy, still digging out of the hole, but digging out at a relatively rapid rate. And the most recent forecast suggests that the quarter just ended, probably came in at 8% quarterly GDP growth, maybe 8.5%, it looks like. Uh, the GDP now forecast from yesterday is 7.8%. The Fed expecting 6.5% for the year as a whole uh, it, it is guiding its monetary policy making with expectations very similar to those uh, in the private sector. And then deceleration to 3% and uh, closer to the 2% potential GDP growth rate over the next couple of years. When you decompose in terms of uh, US GDP growth in terms of expenditure components, you clearly see uh, the consumption leadership, both to the downside and in terms of the subsequent recovery, not so much investment, but uh, definitely consumption. And in Hawaii, we can also decompose uh, into industry components. So here I've just indexed Hawaii GDP to the end of uh, 2019, and you can see how much uh, leadership, as it were, to the downside uh, comprised uh, 
uh, value added or GDP and accommodation, food services, uh, performing arts and whatnot, transportation. Uh, the big the big hit from tourism is our principal export. And then uh, a somewhat more tentative recovery uh, with those components uh, starting to participate in the second half of last year. Um, the forecasts right now um, are, are um, pretty consistent across uh, the board, six and a half, seven percent growth is sort of where people are thinking 2021 will end up for the US. Um, that'd be a, a bit of a deceleration from the 8% growth we might have seen in the quarter just ended. Um, for Hawaii, unfortunately, we had a deeper recession. So growing at six or 7% doesn't get us back to where we started as quickly. Uh, but Hawaii should probably, uh, you know, should probably catch up. And um, I, I think I've updated everything here uh, to the end of, uh, or the early part of this month. I got the new CBO forecast in there. So um, get a copy and then you can see what's going on there. So um, a consumption led recession, which for Hawaii was amplified by the decrease in tourism. And then a consumption led recovery um, is sort of the nature of the downturn and the rebound although um, somewhat more slowly in terms of tourism recovery uh, until uh, this spring, really until February. Um, it was not really clear. In February, you could start to see the advanced booking data tell you that we'd get back to re relatively quickly by summer, but that's always a little sketchy, right? Because people can cancel. Um, and of course, you know, the variants are out there and now they're getting on airplanes coming to Hawaii because nobody has to get a test. So the fat lady has not sung on this opera. Uh, yet, and uh, dude, I'm wearing my mask, sorry, and I got a vaccine, so booyah. Um, yeah, we have an explosion of high frequency data uh, to corroborate some of the official sources. I'll just emphasize a couple um, comparisons of the normal data and the new data to highlight uh, more of these structural attributes. So on the right side, I'm sorry, on the left side of the screen here are the conventional retail sales data. Um, I, retail sales and food services segregated, again, highlighting two aspects, the, you know, this explosion in consumption this spring, um, only partly because of the fiscal stimuli, but that's definitely you know, at work there, uh, but a big restoration of consumer confidence and uh, as I say, an explosion above the pre-COVID trend by you know substantial amounts. Um, whereas food service is just not looking like it's even going to get back to the old trend. You know, maybe. Uh, and and you know, dining was right. Think of all the channels on television that uh, are about eating and where to go to eat. Um, dining out had a, a much more rapid growth rate than retail sales. X food services. Um, another implication of these data that are latent in the retail sales data is the increase in e-commerce and you can actually, the Commerce Department actually publishes uh, those measures and you see that on the right side of the screen. So an additional several percentage points and again, one of these hysteresis effects where a permanent shift upward looks likely to follow in the wake of what might have been at the time thought to be temporary in nature. Um, and I've, I've got a representative path there, so you can kind of do the eyeball regression uh, on your own. Um, we're seeing these supply chain disruptions uh, in the fact that um, uh, these are inventory sales ratios, right? So retail inventories have been drawn down dramatically in 2021, uh, but manufacturing inventories are still kind of hung up. And, and you know, the, the difference between one and the other end of that chain is the, is the, is the logistics, is the supply chain. So still in, still in catch up mode there. These high frequency data sets that uh, became available in the last year from people like Google and um, Affinity Solutions, which are uh, debit and credit card processors, uh, give us other insights. So these are retail spending data in terms of the dollar amounts on a daily basis on the upper part of the screen here. And then on the lower part of the screen uh, from Google, I've got, um, uh, mobility data, right? So tell you how much time, uh, you know, how much time people spent in grocery and pharmacy stores or in retail uh, activities. And um, again, a, a, 
an appearance of maybe a permanent change in that people are spending way more uh, than they used to, uh, but they're not spending as much time in these uh, retail uh, locations. Um, and even if retail or grocery and pharmacy store uh, dwell time goes back to what it was pre-COVID, uh, it's still well below what, you know, we're talking about 20 to 40 to even higher amounts relative to uh, the pre-COVID benchmark. Now, now some of this is the, t the temporary surge associated with the fiscal stimulus, but um, the, the classic one we're looking at now, and again, these are mobility data, is the amount of time people spend uh, in their dwellings uh, relative to the amount of time they spend in formal workplaces, benchmark to the pre-COVID uh, uh, behavioral norm. So here we really see some evidence of that um, shift in the in the location of work, a spatial shift, which has uh, many other implications, not just for real estate, but for transportation, uh, economics, and and so on and so forth. And um, I'm just going to push forward here. Um, uh, and, and dig a little deeper into the work from home phenomenon, uh, we're seeing increasing amounts of evidence uh, to fulfill what rapidly became an expectation a year ago. So this is a survey from May, 2020, uh, just over a year ago. Pre-COVID, 90% of workers had never worked from home. I'll say that again, pre-COVID, 90% of workers never had worked from home and fewer than 5% of workers had work from home full-time, five days a week. Um, at very rapidly, work from home appeared to uh, take hold. And in the survey a year ago, firms were estimating that 25% um, of workers would work from home post-COVID, up from 10%, and uh, a doubling of the proportions who would be working full-time from home. Um, during the course of the last 12 months, um, these expectations were validated. So majorities of companies um, in some of these surveys, as an example, um, reported most or all employees uh, working at home, two thirds in, in, in that case. And we're also seeing evidence that things worked out way better than people expected. So when you ask firms, you know, how'd it work out? They're like, dude, it was awesome. And um, so I, you're getting the sense now that there are gonna be a lot of companies that want to go back to the old ways and they're going to find themselves holding an empty bag and then these other companies that are moving in this new direction are going to get all the productive people um, you can see that in terms of the distribution of work from home uh, as a function of educational attainment so it's the smart kids that are able to uh, and are more productive uh, working in these uh, outside these traditional work environments. Now, it seems likely that we're gonna see some kind of hybrid arrangement be the new normal, but you know, I would guess 20% of the workforce will work from home plus or minus, and that a, a larger proportion will be in hybrid arrangements working, you know, two to three days, you know, three days in the office, two days at home, that kind of thing uh, each week. Other aspects of this productivity, which usually increases after the recession ends, right? So usually productivity increases during the recovery because firms are sluggish to hire, but output is rising. So that's more output per worker. This time productivity went up during the COVID recession because of work from home. So there you go, productivity went up. Investment in IT equipment and software uh, exploded, uh, not just because people were having a have their kids go to school from home, uh, although that was a big factor. Uh, they all have, you know, faster laptops now than they did before. But uh, again, that's, you know, investment in the latest technology means it's the most productive, right? The vintage means it's the most productive technology. And other extraordinary data sets, the amount of new business formation uh, proxied here by applications for a federal employee, uh, I'm sorry, em employer ID, you know, identification number. Um, these exploded. I thought these were gonna be temporary. That's starting to look permanent too. So again, and hysteresis, a temporary change, a change you thought was temporary that 
looks like it's going to be permanent. In terms of labor force participation rates, more interesting patterns. The old buggers are not going back to work. Now, what I've done here is these, these labor force participation rates by age cohort vary a lot, right? Younger people are more likely to be labor force participants than, than older persons. Uh, but if you normalize the data, so you know you just relative to the average for this period, and these are standard deviations, then I think uh, the uh, young people are going back to work, but the old dudes are like, hell no, not at that pay. So the again, big changes um, uh, that um, are going to uh, characterize the nature, the structure of this recovery and distinguish it from previous recoveries. And by the way, what happened to teenage, I mean, look at teenage labor force participation. When I was a teenager, more than half of my peers worked. I didn't until I was 18, but 17. But uh, well, I guess that fits in the 16 to 19 category. But uh, yeah, that's so, I don't know, what are they all playing video games? Okay, Boomer. Uh, so work from home, Maybe here to stay. Uh, there is a debate because if people flee the urban core to the safe haven of suburbs and exurbs and Zoom towns from which they now can work, um, then that's going to change the relative prices of urban core housing. And you're starting to see that backwash happen right now where uh, rents have not kept up or have actually backtracked in you know, midtown Manhattan, for example. Uh, and uh, younger workers are moving in uh, mostly for the lifestyle that uh, is still for them uh, an engaging uh, part of, um, you know, habitation in a way that uh, isn't for old folks. Um, so there we go. That happened. Uh, I want to make a quick comment on implications for the housing market more generally and look at some Hawaii data. So my working hypothesis here is you have a one-time increase in the proportion of workers uh, that will work remotely, let's say from five to 10% pre-COVID to 20 to 30% post-COVID uh, in some form, full-time or hybrid. And that one-time, it's a one-time increase. So it's a step function. That one-time increase in the proportion of workers working remotely means that this year, everybody, the last 12 months, everybody's making those adjustments so it creates a one-time impulse to housing demand or demand for detached dwellings. And therefore, you should, if the hypothesis is correct, you should see differential impacts uh, in the two market segments, single family homes uh, and uh, condominiums, uh, high density uh, housing formats. And you should see a spatial impact, right? So you should see the remote, geographically remote areas uh, benefit and then the urban core areas um, suffer, relatively speaking. Uh, and um, and then the question is, how long does it last? I think it just happened. I think it just ended. And I just came to that conclusion yesterday, by the way. So I just saw the Oahu data, the new Oahu data yesterday, or was it the day before? And I'm like, oh snap, it's over. But uh, maybe that's a premature assessment. So here's what's been happening, right? You, you had the work from home phenomenon and a lot of you know, increase in the demand for single family homes in the suburbs of the exurbs, right? North Shore, East Honolulu, Windward Oahu, uh, the Highlands, you know, uh, uh, Mililani, uh, Makakilo, right? And then you see prices of the urban core uh, under downward pressure. A complicating factor, we shut down tourism for seven or eight months. That means all those vacation rentals, which are not owned by Marriott, they're owned by everybody's auntie, right? They're all small investors. Those guys could not go without a cash flow for six months. So they dumped those condos, mostly condos, on Oahu, it's mostly condos in the vacation rental pool in Waikiki. I mean, I'm sorry for the people in Kailua that want it to be, you know, they want to whine about something because they're from Kailua. But no, it's mostly condos. And so you see a a fire sale externality where people are trying to exit the high density market, uh, both because they are moving to uh, detached uh, dwellings uh, and because of the vacation rental fire sale. And what do you get? Well, you get a big drop in condo sales. These are Oahu numbers. And of course, 
now we have the big rebound. Now this is, if you look at what the Honolulu Board of Realtors press release says, so you read Andrew Gomes' article in the Star Advertiser yesterday, he reports correctly, wow, look at those condo sales. And yeah, look at those condo sales, dude. That's the number of condo sales, right? If you're a realtor, you're all over that. Uh, if you normalize these data, you realize that actually at this point of the recovery, single family and condo volumes aren't that much different from what they were you know, benchmarked to the pre-COVID uh, period. But condo sales fell way farther, further, farther, uh, fell further uh, to, you know, three, a three or four standard deviation decline that, um, you know, is the trough from which they're rebounding. So that, that, that explains some of the interest in the volume. But here again, we have this, one of these supply chain consequences. Condo inventories built up in the COVID interval, as people tried to dump the, fi- the vacation rentals that weren't, ca- weren't were cash flowing zero and are negative. And uh, whereas people in single family homes uh, were hoarding them at the precise moment that more people wanted them. And so you had single family home inventories decline uh, rapidly just before COVID. And then uh, as interest rates were declining and then after, whereas on the condo side, you had the city Double down on its uh, on its vacation rental uh, ban from right. right? They're banned. Vacation rentals are banned. They've been banned on Oahu since 1989. The city just doesn't enforce it. So then they said, "Oh, we're now we're going to enforce it." So everybody started to you know exit, head for the exits, and then COVID came. So that increase in condo inventories, months of inventory remaining, um, was a really notable. I mean, these two time series have a 0.96 correlation when you look at the entirety of the data set from the 1990s through December, 2019, 0.96 correlation. And then it goes to minus 0.6 for six months. But now you can see they're converging again. So as I say, I think this one-time impulse is over and you have to be careful talking about a housing bubble. So here's a real bubble. This is GameStop stock prices. And you can see the recovery in GameStop, GameStop, stock prices uh, in the fall of last year. There's a probably, you know, a reasonable conjecture about the ability of a traditional retail mall, uh, you know, outlet for stuff you can download um, in the uh, the post-COVID recovery. And then of course the bubble in January where everybody on Reddit decided to jump on. I mean, it's a herding event, right? It's 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 a rational stochastic, herding game with asymmetric information. And so there's this bubble. Here's another bubble. These are Nevada home prices during the subprime bubble. So that's a bubble. I don't think we're seeing that right now. And so let's look at the data. Here are Oahu. I don't think we're seeing that in Hawaii right now. We're seeing the tiny bubble that I mentioned earlier, and it's only in single family uh, prices. So here's Oahu's data through June. And then see that little turn from May to June? I seasonally adjusted data so, I mean, these are my data. Honolulu Board of Realtors says June was an all-time high, but I say, yeah, well, it's always higher in June than in May. So when you take make an adjustment for that, it turns out the peak was May and you just missed it. Um, on the condo side, you can see that valuations have actually been relatively stagnant. I mean, they're at the low end of the bandwidth for the mid 20 teens appreciation. Uh, trajectory, which you can just see, I actually ran the regression for you. But that dichotomy is really important. It's not all housing, it's mostly single family. And you see this on Kauai, you see this on Maui, and you see it on the Big Island more or less. It's complicated by the Kilauea um, East Rift eruption back in 2018, which created a a stagnant uh, interval. Um, so I'm pretty sure it's, I'm pretty sure it's um, true everywhere in Hawaii, even though Hawaii is a beneficiary, so to speak, of the vagabond worker sort of refugee phenomenon. Um, you can get dig a little deeper and do the analytics from a detrended standpoint. So here's, uh, this is these are quarterly data. So through the first quarter, single family, median prices on Oahu, condominium prices on Oahu, and then again, you, you see those bubbles. Okay, those are bubbles. And um, and then, so let's take that trend out. See the regression there? So you 
you you take the trend out of what's called the stationary component uh, of the data and so you can extract a cycle and a residual non-cyclical component and there again you see in the single family side a big jump that's that's absent from the condo non-cyclical time series so you know really you just do it informally by eyeballing the data or formally by detrending the data you get this uh you know support for conjecture that you know maybe it's a passing thing and maybe it's concentrated in single family homes here are the neighborhood data to buttress uh, that argument in in 2020 the high flying neighborhoods in terms of price appreciation were north shore of hawaii kai east honolulu makakilo mililani windward oahu and the places with the biggest decreases were in town um kind of sort of true for condos even um, right, with Waikiki getting the beat down from the vacation rental um, enforcement threat. And um, similar kinds of evidence, I'll just show you Maui, where West Maui is going off and Maui County's hottest market last year, Molokai, um, versus, you know, more conventional neighborhoods and, uh, uh, you know, around the island where prices were flat to down, Kahului, Wailuku, where prices were flat to down or appreciating at more modest rates of increase. And here are the, here are the condo data, um, which are fewer in numbers, so not providing not as good guidance, but again, a bit of a West Maui tilt there. And we can even look at the distributions. So these are home price distributions for some, you know, uh, I've broken down the big island into three components. So Kona and Kauai are kind of similar markets. Uh, Hilo and the People's Republic of Kau are, are more affordable markets. And you, you see that push in the in the empirical, this is an estimated empirical distribution of home prices. Post-COVID, you see that push at the higher end uh, that's coming uh, from this phenomenon, which you should observe in the higher order moments. So I've highlighted the fourth moment, kurtosis, in the Kauai data in a pre-post-COVID comparison, right? I start the clock ticking in second quarter 2020, and then I measure four quarters and compare it to the prior year. Uh, Oahu, by the way, um, when you combine single family and condo uh, price data, um, it doesn't show up that obviously. I've, I've, I've selected some sample years to make the point that the transition ordinarily is, is uh, quite ordinary, order, orderly in appearance. Okay, so think of it as the median price going up on trend on this log linear trend at let's say 2% per year after inflation, 4% including inflation. And that means that the distribution is changing in a relatively orderly fashion over time. But when you have bubbles just here, it's like 19, early 1990s and, and uh, you know, the, the middle part of the early 2000s, 2005, 6, 7, you do have the distributions bulge out as you see on Kauai and in Kona now. Uh, as a consequence of this uh, remote worker phenomenon. So blah, 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 blah. Did I do all this? Blah, 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 blah. You can read the bullet points. I'm not going to, right? If you're looking for an asset pricing bubble, it should be detached from fundamentals. Typically there's information asymmetry. Some people know more than others. Hurting like the Reddit crowd and people whose expectations are formed with regard to other people's expectations, right? So they're thinking, well, that guy thinks it's gonna be worth more. So I'm gonna buy it because I'm gonna sell it to him because he thinks it's gonna be more later. I don't think we're experiencing anything like that. Not completely, right? The fundamentals of low interest rates are consistent with robust valuation uh, changes. Um, but, you know, it's it has this weird spatial, the donut effect as Nick Bloom at Stanford calls it, where it's affecting the outer parts of the urban areas and not the inner core. And of course, uh, it's a demand, an increase in demand from a biological event. So risk averse individuals responding to a biological shock um, in uh, the presence of inelastic housing supply, inelastic housing supply to begin with, not to mention at $800, a thousand board feet or whatever it's called, or not, not to mention in the presence of a, of a transitory supply shock uh, pushing building materials prices upward temporarily. So uh, that, that I think most of that stuff's gonna resolve itself over the next six months. 
the thing that's not going to resolve itself, they're not going to give you a building permit anyway. So give it up and <laughs> forget about it. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, this vagabond worker thing, I think, is something we really need to keep our eyes on. It's, it's changing the character of the workplace. It's changing the character of neighborhoods. It's, it's um, uh, what's the expression? Uh, bigotry is bubbling to the surface. Well, take a straight up bigotry. You know, people saying, we don't want those guys in our neighborhood. Wow, really? Did you just say that? Let me guess, they changed the character of the neighborhood? Dude, oh, uh, okay. Right? People actually say that. And uh, well, we'll just have to see what happens. I'll stop there. It leaves actually a few minutes for uh, questions if you're interested. How do I, let's say I stop share here. Do I see some questions in the chat? Um, I'm gonna work from the backward to the, to the front part. Yeah, uh, I'll work from the, from the back. So uh, somebody commenting that uh, auto prices were a big factor in the consumer price index. Yeah, the two, the two big factors were used car prices. My son bought a Chevy Suburban. Why would you need one? He lives in Denver. He bought a, a used Chevy Suburban six months ago for $5,000. He just sold it last month for 8,000. Who makes money on a used car? So that's going on. It showed up in the CPI. And of course, because oil is back to $60, $70 a barrel, up from $30, $40 a barrel, which was down from $60 to $70. I mean, that's the thing everybody forgets. Oil prices went down, then they came back up, and now everybody's having a cow. So a lot of that is, you know, autos and, and, and uh, liquid fuel prices, which show up in the CPI uh, index. Are, are, you know, the smoking guns, so to speak, and what I, I, I would say is a transitory phenomenon. Um, as long as the Fed's managing their leaky floor framework, I'm, I'm not sure what that expression means because I don't hang out with bankers and traders like I used to. Um, can they defy Friedman's always and everywhere? Look, it, as long as people are, as long as banks are hoarding liquidity, then the Fed will let it sit there. And then as banks decide they don't need it, and you know, we get permission to pay dividends and whatnot. Um, I, I think you'll see that deep pool of liquidity drain off and the Fed, are, it's, it's at the Fed. They're the people who can recognize it as it happens in real time and will adjust the asset side of their balance sheet uh, accordingly. Um, what kind of model do I use to forecast Hawaii GDP? Divine revelation. Okay, are services like Uber Eats, Grubhub, and DoorDash food service? I I I just don't know. Um, there is a seminar, a, a, a several day webinar now that the National Association for Business Economics um, holds each summer. I used to never go because they have it at the Four Seasons in Washington D.C. Who can afford it? But now it's online, and um, it's an it's an economic data conference for a couple of days and all the guys from BLS and BEA and Census Bureau. Um, so the question is, are Uber Eats, Grubhub, DoorDash, are they food services? Are they e-commerce providers? I don't know. All will be revealed at this annual uh, meeting. If you're interested, check it out, nabe.com. And um, is the future bright, bleak, or moderate? Well, look, uh, here, Th this, is a, this is a really good question. Is the future bright bleak or let me show you just what i have in the appendix just for a second uh so i, I mean i'm pretty optimistic obviously the economy is moving back fairly quickly but let's go to the end here can you guys see this somebody unmute themselves and say yes this is my appendix on fiscal policy which basically says ppp was a loser uh here's why you shouldn't worry about the deficit because r is less than g which is less than new. And here's my appendix on why I'm not as optimistic as you might think. So if people are leaving Oahu, and if they've been leaving Oahu for years and years and years, and now they're leaving Oahu in numbers larger than all other sources of population growth combined, if Oahu, if Honolulu has been depopulating for five straight years, 
I'm sorry, is that four? One, two, three, for four straight years and was doing so three years before COVID ever was invented in a lab in Wuhan, China. That's not true. I mean, people were leaving before COVID. <laughs> so it's so good, people are leaving. Uh, that, you know, have you, have you done your housing forecast? How, have you, you know, have you modeled housing absorption in a world in which Oahu just lost 30,000 people? Oh, here's another good one. Let me go back to that slide. I think I have, so here's Oahu. Here's all the neighbor islands. They brought people are leaving Maui. <laughs> um, Hawaii's losing people faster than, you know, almost any other state. And oh, I didn't put the other. So here's what you do. You go look at the DBED forecast, the state of Hawaii's official population forecast from June, 2018, three years ago. You look at that forecast and then you look at the actual population three years later, the difference is 60,000 people. That's 20,000 homes. Housing crisis solved. I'm just saying that, that that's just arithmetic. So this depopulation is something we really need to be attentive to. It's not small. It's not happening anywhere else. People don't leave the cool places. And you know, the places they're moving are Idaho, Utah, Nevada, Arizona. So, I mean, they're cool places if you're a tourist. I don't know about living in Coeur d'Alene, but look, that's that's what's happening in the country and that's what's happening on Oahu. So for that reason, my optimism about the 2020s is being tempered by our population loss and the implications it has for say housing and other aspects of the economy that we, we ought to be spending more time talking about. Let me see if I can just get, oops, just get to another couple of those questions. I don't, oh, there they are. So thank you. I, I'm, I, I guess I can name names because you can all see that Tony asked if the future is bright, bleak or moderate. It's Mizuno. Um, you know, it's pretty good, but this thing with people leaving is not a good thing. Um, should I call it a bubble when housing supply, the price elasticity of housing supply is so low, right? Housing supply is so inelastic. Well, that that would be one of the factors contributing, right? If housing supply is inelastic, then right, then any increase in demand from your perspective is all gonna go into prices. It's not going to go into new production. Why? Because it takes 20 years to get permission. If you're Castle and Cook, if you're Castle and Cook, it takes 20 years to get permission to build on land you own, vacant land, across from a Costco, next to a freeway off-ramp, 20 years. So yeah, if you're brada brada like you and me, I don't think we're gonna get permission to build. And that's, that's a big issue. Um, uh, the dearth of supply, as the questioner continues, is something we already knew was present uh, and has just been you know, revealed in all its glory to be even worse than we thought. Um, Again, uh, a question about uh, coming full circle and maybe to the end now, a uh, question about tourism. Passenger arrivals, domestic passenger arrivals have actually exceeded the pre-pandemic volumes for this time of year, just slightly. But we went right back to the pre-COVID peak seasonal benchmarks of summer. And this is this is it right now, June, July. and. Um, how does daily spending compare? You know, we don't know, but thanks to our glorious leaders at the legislature, we may never know because they just cut the budget for the Hawaii Tourism Authority. Good job. And uh, so we don't know how much agricultural output we have. And so now we won't know how much tourism export receipts. Um, we, I mean, I don't know. The, my friends over at HTA are, you know, been working their butts off the last year trying to keep the engine running and get us good data. Uh, obviously things kind of fell apart where you don't have enough people, right? Then the statistical, you know, the sampling methodologies and, and whatnot 
uh, get all kapakahi. But we were sort of back in action this spring. And those of us who are data users are all grinding those data sets. Uh, and I, I hope they're still around. I mean, you cut the, cut the budget of the tourism authority. I don't know. In my experience, the first thing management cuts is research. Hello. Remember where I used to work? So, I mean, that's, that's true everywhere. That's true in the public sector. That's true in the private sector. Cut research. At $7 a bushel, biotech research in Hawaii was a $240 million industry. At $3.50 a bushel, it's a $120 million industry. That's how that works. So you cut the budget for research at HTA, we may never know. The only reason we have daily passenger accounts, by the way, is because after 9-11, a bunch of us sat in a room with the governor and he said, well, what, what are we going to do? And I said, you know, the bugger over at the airports division, the accounts gets all the passenger manifests and per, tell Pearl over here, Pearl Imara Iboshi, chief economist at DBED at the time, they have Pearl posted on her website. And she started, you go look at the daily passenger accounts. When do they start? September, 2001. So that's the kind of thing. We saw this with this crisis. COVID precipitated a bunch of new data we've never seen before. Some of it we're still learning how to use, but uh, you know, Going the other direction and not having data is not a good way to uh, point uh, to the future. And I, I would just say, I, I don't know how spending looks right now because I haven't looked at it lately. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be happy to take any you know, a client assignment so to do. And with that, I'll say mahalo and aloha. Sorry I muted all your videos. I miss all you guys from all those years working downtown with you. And I think we're Paul, Bob. Yeah, thank you so much, Paul. As always, you always uh, leave us a bunch of things to think about and dwell on. Uh, but we really appreciate you um, doing this for the RMA chapter again. Uh, My pleasure. So, I'll so post we'll, I'll, we'll I'll, look forward. I'll get a PDF for you guys of the slides. I'll uh, uh -huh. figure out how to post the video or make sure you guys you can post it somewhere. And uh, then you guys know where I am. Check me out anytime. Paul Brubaker at tzeconomics.com. Mahalo. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Paul. And we look forward to uh, your 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 video and your slides. Right on. Thanks. Ooh, I didn't copy okay. the questions, but uh, I think we covered them. So mahalo, you guys. Okay. Thanks so much.